Yes, I think we're good to go. Okay, well, I'll just welcome everybody. Um, I appreciate um, the Pavement Preservation Council um, letting Missouri LTAP be involved. My name is Heath Pickerel, director of the LTAP Center. Um, we're located in Rolla at Missouri University of Science and Technology. Um, Christy Barr is on here as well. Uh, Christy has uh, been the one here in the LTAP office that has coordinated um, and set all of this up. So Christy, thank you very much for all of your time and effort on this. Um, and again, um, thank you Pavement Preservation Council for involving us and, and allowing us to help you reach all of the local agencies uh, throughout Missouri. And with that, I will hand it off. Well, um, thank you, Heath. Thank you, Christy. And welcome to all of you who are joining us today um, virtually for uh, part three in the Missouri Pavement Preservation Council series. Um, today's uh, topic is going to be top of the curve treatments. But before we get into uh, the discussion today, you may be wondering, what is the Missouri Pavement Preservation Council. And uh, really what it is, it's a, uh, a group of individuals uh, within the industry that, that came together uh, to promote pavement preservation. And really these webinar series are intended for elected officials, local agency uh, managers, engineers, uh, street supervisors, crew leaders, and engineering consultants. And the intent is to provide uh, valuable and uh, helpful information for pavement practitioners to better manage their roads and their street networks. And so all of us that really created this, this group, uh, we did so really just to promote pavement preservation and to uh, provide an educational outlet and forum and resource to all of you on the phone and, and those hopefully that will be joining us. Uh, when we started, we, we basically started with uh, four uh, companies and uh, I'd like to introduce the, the founding members, uh, Mike Hartman from Missouri Petroleum, uh, Sean Bros from Vance Brothers, Jack Witte from Corrective Asphalt Materials, Caitlin Kalakak from Microsurfacing Contractors, and I'm Brett Gaither, um, and I work with Microsurfacing Contractors as well. So uh, today I really have the, the honor and the privilege to introduce our, our speakers. And uh, the first gentleman I'd like to introduce, his name is Chris Evers. And Chris is the executive uh, coordinator for the Florida Pavement Preservation Council. So uh, we, we at Missouri are trying to mirror uh, what Chris Evers is doing over there with Florida and uh, develop a very robust uh, program. So we're excited to have Chris join us today. I think you guys will be thrilled with his enthusiasm and his knowledge and, and uh, his communication style. The other individual that's uh, going to be presenting today, I call him the OG. His last name is Gail House, and he is the original founder and uh, really the main guy behind pavement preservation. And uh, Larry Gail House is the founder and director emeritus for the National Center of Pavement Preservation. So when we have one of these series and you get to talk to the main people. These two individuals are really driving the bus when it comes to pavement preservation. And they have a very, very, very good um, program lined up today. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to both Chris and Larry. Thank you guys for your knowledge, your expertise, your professionalism and your time today. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate it. And, and uh, I, it's not very often that I get an introduction that includes the OG. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be uh, uh, with the OG, Larry Gale House. Um, and, you know, I remember being a new kid on the block to pavement preservation back in the uh, mid 90s. And, and uh, many, many moons have passed. And, and I've gotten to know Larry over this last uh, uh, 15, 20 years. And, and it's just awesome to be able to uh, continue to take this 
show on the virtual road, pun intended. So we're going to go in and, and really get right to it. Um, and it really, if you've listened to some of the other things that, uh, that we've talked about, we talked about the top of the curve, we talked about, um, or we're going to talk about the top of the curve today. We talked about distresses and, and uh, you know, how to find distresses. We talked about worse first. We've talked about a number of things. Uh, and so today we're going to really dive into the gist of it and get into um, really how to get started at the very top of the curve. And uh, let's kind of start off with a, a quick poll question. Uh, Christy, if you don't mind, pull those that bad boy up. So what level of training is your agency or company provided on pavement preservation? Let's Let's just kind of gauge the audience and, and see, uh, you know, what we've got here and how many folks are, are experienced, not experienced, so we get a handle on that. Okay, all right, a couple more seconds here. Excellent. Okay. Well, so it looks like the predominance is uh, is really that uh, low to moderate. Uh, we've got some folks that are that are new to the training and welcome aboard if that's the case. And we have a a high level. We've got one high level expert. So uh, thanks for joining us. We hope everybody uh, learns something. And I think uh, I think what we want to try to do as we get into this is uh, and and Larry's going to spend a lot of his time, but that think about our pavements differently. Instead of waiting until they get to be where they're uh, in need of mill and resurfacing or replacement, uh, let's catch them earlier. And what we know is that when we do that, we have uh, not only a better success uh, from the perspective of longevity of the pavements, that makes sense, uh, but we also get more support from our uh, taxpayers because they understand that uh, you know even you know though we don't give them credit for this a lot of times, they understand that. Uh, anytime you take care of a fixed asset, it's going to last longer. That's going to save money, and it's their money after all that we're uh, that we're dealing with. So we want to make sure that we uh, take care and that we're good stewards of that uh, money. So uh, you may have, uh, if you joined us before, you may have seen this uh, in module two. We talked about investing, um, and so we talk about that top of the curve, and that's going to yield the highest rate of return. Uh, and so really roads should be no different than your uh, retirement, uh, you know, your portfolio and your stock market uh, is you can invest in road A, B, or C, and they're going to yield very different results. And so to compare uh, this graphic with this very, very popular uh, graphic from Federal Highway Administration, you can see that that first 40% drop in the quality of any pavement happens over a pretty long period of time, almost three quarters of the life of the pavement. And then that next 40% drop to uh, you know, utter disaster and failure happens over 12%. And so what we wanna try to do is invest the, the small amounts of money up here at the top of the curve or road C, if you look at it as the uh, right pavement at the right time. Uh, and when you're investing there, you want to, you, you know, like we talk about for, for any, you know, investment is we want to keep our uh, winners, you know, in the game, as they say, and we want to uh, cut our losers. Um, and so the way that we're going to do that is what you're going to learn about today. Um, an analogy that I use all the time is if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's definitely true. Uh, what we hope to do uh, for those of you uh, who are end users, the, the, really the approach is get more tools in the toolbox. And if you have more tools, then you're going to be able to uh, utilize those at the right time on the right road uh, and, and get the right results, uh, more importantly. So the larger, more sophisticated your roadway network is, the more tools you should have. You know, if you have one road, uh, then you may not need, you know, uh, 12 different, uh, you know, tools. Um, so Larry calls it the uh, mix of fixes, and, and you're going to start to learn about those uh, mixes of fixes, uh, but it's really a great way to uh, get started. The, the other thing is that the, the least uh, technologically challenging and the least design uh, you know, needed is up at the top of the curve. Uh, many of these are uh, fog seals, rejuvenators, might be chip seals. Uh, scrub seals. So these typically do not uh, require a lot of heavy duty engineering. 
And so that's one of the other benefits. So that's why we're starting there. Um, so let's look at the uh, poll question number two. What types of processes have you used? So just uh, hit those and let's see what we have as far as the number of um, uh, different processes, tools, as they say, have been used by everyone. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds as the uh, results come streaming in. Looks like we've got a pretty, pretty tight race here. Okay, so uh, looks like we've got a, a neck and neck with chip seals and uh, you know crack sealing. And then we have uh, micro rejuvenation and finally fog seals and, and uh, scrub seals. So uh, pretty fascinating. It does not surprise me at all, especially knowing that you're uh, in Missouri. I grew up in Kansas, uh, so I know what the weather's like. Um, and so it's a little different than, than here in Florida, what we count on, where we don't have quite the reliance on uh, crack seal. So moving on, uh, we're really entering in this module, module three, we're entering the prescription phrase, okay? The, the thing that we look at is now that you've seen uh, in previous modules, why, and this is kind of a busy slide, but why road C is the, the right road to invest uh, your money in. We want to look at how to invest that money. And so we're looking at uh, a number of the different factors. Uh, the right treatment will depend on a number of different things. And so we want to present these tools and then how to select those tools. And this is where many agencies will use a decision tree. And I, I uh, highly recommend that. Uh, is even if you're just building it on a piece of paper or a whiteboard, uh, really try to plan out, you know, when we use different things based on uh, whether it's the um, uh, traffic levels, the uh, classification of the roadway, uh, the condition of the roadway, there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, but one of the things that's most important really is the functional classification of the road and the speed. Speed limit, no. You know, if you see that, you're not going to want to put certain uh, types of treatments that could cause an unsafe condition. Now, uh, the other thing is if your road looks like this right here, uh, you're probably not going to use a chip seal, for instance. So um, that's going to be used on more of a rural two-lane uh, county road. Uh, so what kind of road are we dealing with? These treatments do have limitations. And again, these treatments are in and of themselves not good or bad, they're good and bad in the uh, right or wrong situation. Uh, I can pick a terrible uh, you know, uh, situation for each one of these treatments that where I can just assure not having success. So that's why this module is really gonna get into not only introducing you to the treatment itself, but where uh, you really should look to use that. Uh, speed is always a consideration. Um, safety, of course, is our, our number one goal. Uh, and, and job, and so we want to make sure that that's maintained at all times. So this is a graphic that I love from the uh, PPRA, that's the uh, Pavement Preservation Recycling Alliance, um, and if you go to roadresource.org, I believe, uh, you can actually get a lot of good, valuable information from there, uh, but you want to select the treatment that's going to preserve against the dominant distress, and so if I look up here at the top of the curve or the top of the road, uh, here of the, the the A road, there really is not a whole lot of distress. If there's anything, might be some uh, light oxidation. Then as you go down, uh, the, you're not only getting older roads, but you're also getting, uh, you know, some predominantly different uh, distresses, cracks, uh, longitude transverse, uh, raveling, those kinds of things. And then uh, here at the bottom, then we're getting almost out of pavement preservation altogether. Uh, so if you want the road to be protected, you've got to anticipate what distress is likely to occur. And, and you really want to focus on one word in here, and that's anticipate. Uh, all of the things that we teach uh, with the National Center and the Pavement Preservation Councils is preventative. It's uh, preventative measures. So to be preventative, really, what we need to be able to do is anticipate what kind of distress is going to crop up when. Uh, and we're not guessing. I mean, we really know as the ages of the of the pavements, you know, continue, we can look at the pavement and see. Uh, then we know what those distresses are going to be. So in Florida, it's likely a sunburn. In Missouri, it can be a number of different things. So 
I'm going to turn uh, this over now to Larry Galehouse, and he can go through and talk about the actual uh, treatments at the top of the curve, and then I'll rejoin you for some final thoughts and Q&A here in a little bit. Larry. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, before I get into my presentation, I want to thank the uh, council. And it wouldn't be possible without the council. I also want to thank the LTAP Center and Christy because this has been, you know, a labor of love for all everybody concerned. Uh, we really believe in these topics, and I want to express to you the importance of following this whole idea of making the right treatment selection. And there's a whole big toolbox, and the importance of using this big toolbox is extremely important. I mean, you're not going to take your car into a garage that has one or two tools, obviously. You want a garage that has all kinds of uh, uh, opportunities to fix your vehicle, just like you want to have a lot of treatments to fix your roadway. So as we get into this, what I want to uh, give you is a quick outline of what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about chemical properties in the asphalt binders. And then we're going to jump into rejuvenators, the spray applied rejuvenators, and I'll share a little bit about those. We're going to talk about emulsified asphalt fog seals, crack sealing, crack filling, there's a difference. Uh, we're going to jump into chip seals and then the slurry systems. Slurry systems are slurry seals and micro surfacing. So when you hear the term slurry systems, it could be either one of those. And then we're going to do the quick check because everybody always asks, how much money should I put into pavement preservation? And we're going to go through that so you can figure out exactly how much money you should put into it. And uh, so let's get started here. First, uh, we're going to talk about the chemical properties of the asphalt binders. And I have a poll question for you. So Christy, if you could share that. And the question is, is the quality of the unmodified asphalt binders today as good as the asphalt binders of your grandfather's era? And these are unmodified asphalt binders. We'll give you a few more seconds here. All right. It's a it's an important thing to consider. And and the answer is really no. And it's not the fault of your suppliers, not the fault of your contractor, but where are the asphalts produced? And they're produced in a refinery. The refineries are getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, they pull more of the high-end oil, top, top volatiles off from the asphalt. Um, and you can, you can all tell this just by looking at your roadways. When you pave a road with an asphalt pavement, how long does it take for it to gray out? And generally speaking, you can see a difference in about six months, certainly within a year. Uh, years ago, when they would pave a road, it would stay jet black for a number of years. And it's not that anything else is different. It's a fact that the asphalt is it's not the same quality as it used to be. Now, we enhance it by putting um, modifiers and additives on it. But the actual sticky binder itself just is not what it used to be. So we're going to jump into this. Get my cursor over here so I can advance the slides. If you look at what is in an asphalt or a petroleum product, and let's, let's talk about petroleum because petroleum is really crude oil. And a crude oil is a fossil fuel. We all know that. It's comprised of dev, dead organisms and so forth. When we obtain crude oil, we generally pump it out of the ground. But there are sands out there, and they call them tar sands. And we can actually get it from the surface. But you know, the average depth of the wells used to be, just in 2000, used to be about 3,500 feet. That was the average depth of, a, of an oil well. Um, Today, we're having them go as deep as 40,000 feet. That's seven and a half miles down. 
in directional drilling and so on and so forth. So there's been an awful lot changed. But if you look at all the products out there that are derived from crude or petroleum based product, they're countless. It's all a question of economics, folks. If I can sell something like a, a Sullivan or something for more money than I can get out of asphalt, I'm going to do that. It's a question of economics. Uh, gasoline is certainly more expensive per gallon than what an asphalt binder would be. So if I can drive more, pull more products out of my binder to, to put into the gasoline, I'm going to do that because that's my greatest profit margin. So moving on, you've got two basic components in an asphalt binder. You've got asphaltines and maltines. And the asphaltines are a hard, brittle, and insoluble component of the asphalt, but they're not as highly reactive as the maltines and thus furnishing the asphalt binder, binder as structure. Maltines are the volatile and they're susceptible to great uh, to degradation and, and oxidation. And it's, it's true all through this. So if you break the components, the main components of an asphalt down, you've got five different areas. You've got your asphaltines, which is one side of the equation, but then you got all of these other acidophens and hydrocarbons and polar compounds and so forth. And this is where you need a petroleum engineer to kind of get into this. But the bottom line is if you look at the acidophens or the hydrocarbons, they kind of remind you of things that you may buy at a gas station or in a hardware store. And so they're going to start pulling these things out of your asphalt binder. And it, it's just, it's a question of economics, as I said before. So let's move ahead. You take this binder that you've got, and now it could be an additive and it could be a polymer and so forth. And you're going to put it into a drum plant. Uh, there's a few batch plants around, but most of the time they're drum plants. And um, they heat the binder up. Obviously, your mix is getting hot. Um, you know, a regular HMA, they'll heat up to three or 275 to 300 degrees. A polymer modified, maybe even a little hotter, you know, 285, 320. Some of them even go up to 350. And then your warm mix, it's 200, 250 degrees. But the bottom line is it's hot. And when you heat something up, it's going to give off fumes. And these, these fumes are really your volatiles that are going up the stack. And so you're losing some of the properties of your binder. And that's generally speaking, if you put a PG grade in one end of your drum plant, it's going to come out a stiffer binder at the other end. That's just a fact. So now we've got what Mother Nature does to us. You've got the binder that's deteriorating in place. And why is it deteriorating? It's because exposure to the sun, it's the temperatures, and both of those by themselves create the oxidation. You get the stripping action from the, you know, the storm water and, and just the wear of traffic. And so basically, you've got this surface out there that's taking, taking a real beating. And so... <clears throat> That's really the start of your deterioration cycle right there. You get a new mix down there and it begins to age from day one. Once you pave it and you've all been out on a paving job, you can literally smell the volatiles going up. You can smell them right off a new paving job. They're going to just dissipate as the pavement ages. They're going to get a few less as it cools and so forth, but you're still losing your maltine fractions. And so it's just the effect of the sun and the water and so forth. You're really getting yourself into trouble. That's why asphalt pavements begin to age. So now let's talk about some of the preventive or preservation measures that we can really improve our pavement condition for the long haul. Let's talk about the spray applied asphalt rejuvenators. And there's really two types. You have petroleum based rejuvenators and then you have your agricultural based rejuvenators or sometimes called bio based. But then there's two classifications of both of those. 
you have your mixing grade and your spray applied grade. Your mixing grades are really something they're going to use in your plants with wrap, uh, maybe hot in place recycling, um, full depth reclamation, cold in place. That's where you're going to use your mixing grades. But your spray applied grades are those that we're going to put right on the surface. And so let's look into those a little bit. What you're really doing is you're replacing the volatiles or the high end oils that are la that are lost through the whole hot mix process. And you're actually put putting those back into your pavement. The the whole idea of these is when it goes into the surface on a dense graded pavement. Think about this, all your deterioration on your asphalt pavement is going to start at the top and work down, assuming you have a good pavement structure. You don't have reflective cracking and all this problem, but for the bottom or for the, for the absolute use of these, you're going to apply them on the top where your deterioration occurs. The rejuvenation will come down as a, a color coded product. It comes out either pink or white. In this case, it looks almost pinkish. And this color will be there. Now, why do they have it colored? It is because you as a consumer are going to know you got a rejuvenator. If it comes out brown, you're not getting a rejuvenator. You may get a rejuvenator in an emulsion, but you're not getting a true petroleum-based rejuvenator. This coloration disappears as it sinks into the surface of the roadway. A dense graded pavement is only going to sink maybe a half inch into the, into the pavement. They work very well on open graded because you begin to, you know, um, get brittleness into your open graded pavement. And this will rejuvenate or revitalize the asphalt and you'll get better retention on an open graded pavement. These are examples of a petroleum based rejuvenator. You can actually see, and, and I think all of you have noticed this driving down a roadway. The best time to really notice if your roadway is soaking up water is right around a rainstorm. Right after it quits raining, you can drive down the pavement and roadway and you can see areas that look dry and other areas look damp. What you want is you want a tight bond on that surface. You do not want water to soak into your pavement structure at all. So putting down a rejuvenator, you're going to seal that up. And that's really what we're doing with a lot of these treatments. We're going to seal the roadway up. Uh, they've all got benefits. And what's really important is I'm going down a sliding scale here as far as costs. I'm starting at the least expensive and then we're going to begin to work down. But they're all inexpensive when you consider what you're getting for that. Uh, it's, it's a real bargain for agencies and most agencies today are starved for money. And so you've got to make do with very little uh, funding. But this is an example of, you know, three years after one treatment, you can see how the treated area is shedding water where the untreated area is, you know, allowing the water to soak into your structure. You can also see on to the right side of the picture where raveling has occurred in the untreated area where the treated area is still pretty tight because uh, you've really prevented that oxidation and drying out of the binder. Another advantage of a petroleum based rejuvenator when it goes down is you don't have to repaint your, your pavement. Uh, the pavement markings are still there. Uh, if truth in advertising, you know, you have a reflective glass beads in your, in your pavement markings, you may dull those up a little bit, uh, but you're still able to see it. So you don't have to go out and repaint your roadway right away. Uh, it's, it's really, um, a benefit for an agency to use these. Now, when should you use them? You want to use them early on. You can't wait until the roadway is, is got all kinds of cracking and so forth. I would say anywhere from the first six months or, you know, after six months to maybe the first, uh, after three, within three years. So that's your time frame when you would want to use a rejuvenator. Use them on a new pavement that's in good condition and you're going to keep your good pavement in good condition. Um, 
Then they have the bio base rejuvenators. Now this is a real uh, problem in our emulsion task force uh, that you know we run through the center. We're looking at the bio base rejuvenators. We're trying to figure out you know which ones work, which ones don't. What are performance tests that we can monitor? And we're going to do this for both the bio based and petroleum based rejuvenators. Uh, because there are a lot of them out there and not all of them work the same and some of them don't work at all. So we're getting into this. Uh, California has a few test methods, but um, there needs to be more research done in this area. And I'm um, be upfront with you that, you know, all the answers aren't um, there for the bio-based rejuvenators quite yet. Um, they supposedly provide excellent skid resistance, but I can tell you anything you spray on the surface, if you don't blot it or retexturize it first, you could have a potential slippery condition. So, you know, they've used them in different places. Um, time will tell. And um, I'm not saying yes or no about them. It's just the question that we have not seen them in the long term to really judge the performance. So, um, gives you an idea. Let's get into something that you would normally think of a fog seal and that's the emulsified asphalt fog seal. So um, moving ahead with this, and you know something, I think I've skipped a couple poll questions. And so can we have the second poll question? And this will be a good um, test for you. Um, What's the primary role of an asphalt team? Provides the black color to the asphalt, gives the asphalt binder its structure, or reacts well with asphalt modifiers. Okay, we're gonna close it out in just a few more seconds. So please put your answers down there. Okay, and the answer I think most of you got is really it gives the asphalt binder its structure. Um, and uh, so that's good. Everybody was pretty much paying attention to that. I've got another question here too. Let's put up question number three. We can see if everybody was paying attention to this. Okay, split, uh, spray applied asphalt rejuvenators are applied by fog sealing the pavement. Okay. Give it a few more seconds here. Don't be afraid, throw your answer down there. Okay, the answer is true. Um, really applied by fog sealing. And that means that, you know, um, it is a term that is used to uh, spray apply uh, a light mist of petroleum or bio-based product onto the roadway. So um, paying attention and that's really good. So now we're going into the emulsified asphalt fog sealers. Uh, what they are is they're just a diluted asphalt emulsion. Now, the thing is, it's got to be a slow setting emulsion. And why slow setting is because you want this emulsion to settle down into the voids on your pavement structure. If you had a rapid based or a rapid setting uh, asphalt emulsion, uh, you would have a slippery mess out there. I mean, because it would not have the time to enter into the pavement structure. So. The whole advantage of this is really to seal up your pavement. And it gives that asphalt coating uh, around some of your aggregate. So it will really eliminate the raveling potential. Um, if you put a rejuvenator in an emulsified asphalt fog seal, it will actually enrich the pavement structure a little bit as far as the surface. <clears throat> And the, the other thing is they really provide a delineation out there. So things will stand out pretty clear. 
Now people are saying, well, you know, I put down a fog seal and uh, geez, the next year or six months later, I can't even see it's done any good. And it's a waste of money. I mean, I've heard that from people. The thing is, take a look at it again, after a rain, you'll see the water has shed off the road. It's not entering down into the pavement structure. Even though you can't see it, it works. The same way with a rejuvenator. You cannot see it, but it works. And just drive out there after a rain and you can tell the value you're getting. Okay, we'll move to the next one here. This is a, a case where there's an awful lot of streets out there that could use a rejuvenator or an emulsified fog, asphalt fog seal. Um, we have miles and miles of shoulders that seem to be forgotten because you know they're not reading your pavement condition on your shoulders and yet your shoulders are an expensive part of your highway network. And so we've got to maintain the shoulders and, and these are relatively inexpensive treatments, as I say. So if we do them early, we can get a big lead on, on stopping deterioration. It will fill those voids, it will prevent raveling and, and really slow the oxidation process down. So it's a worthwhile activity. Um, note that a fog seal has to be put down with a distributor. Uh, you've got to make sure you have a decent spray pattern. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit more with, with chip seals because they also use a distributor. But um, we have some other factors here that I wanna discuss. Um, I think most of you are aware of what an asphalt emulsion is, but if you're not, an asphalt emulsion is put together with, with the, of course, asphalt and water, and they use a surfactant or a soap, so they're much like salad dressing. They'll stay in suspension. What you're doing with a fog seal is you're further diluting the emulsion because if you take the emulsion itself, there's about 67% of that water mixture, 67% of that is asphalt. The rest is water, it's going to evaporate up. But when you're really dealing with a fog seal, you have to reduce that residual even further by adding more water. And that's important to do, otherwise you're gonna have one slippery mess out on the roadway. So the dilution factor is generally a one-to-one. -one. You're adding one part of emulsion with one part of water. And you've got to make sure that the water is compatible with the emulsion. And what I mean by that is that if you put a water uh, water into an emulsion that's got a high mineral content or something of that sort, you're going to run into problems. Also, when you get an emulsion, it's warm. It's uh, shipped out of the manufacturer, it's warm. So if you uh, find a source of water and, and you, from a hydrant or, or maybe a clean water source somewhere and you put it into the emulsion, it's going to shock it. And you're going to have all kinds of problems. And so you want a residue content of at least 50% or less uh, of a slow setting emulsion with the water. Um, what we recommend, and I think everybody is beginning to understand this, is if you're going to do a fog seal, get the diluted emulsion sent to you from the manufacturer's plant. Let them dilute it for you because they'll use water that's compatible with the, the um, water they mix to make the emulsion to begin with. Uh, they'll add the water warm. So you're going to get a product that's going to work. People sometimes they go out and they'll pull it out of a hydrant and anybody that has ever seen what comes out of a fire hydrant, if it hasn't been flushed, it's not going to work very well with an emulsion. It's going to probably just give you all kinds of problems. So make sure you get the emulsion from the plant.
Ashto has some construction guide specs for fog seals, and they call for either a M140 or 208, and one could be an anionic and the other could be a cationic emulsion. So it doesn't matter um, whether you use a CSS1 uh, or um, SS1, SS being slow set, the CSS cationic slow set, um, but it should really be diluted prior to delivery in the plant. Your residual asphalt content shall never be less than 28%. In other words, you're going to have a lot of water in there. You're going to have, what are we talking about? 72% of what you're getting is water. But because it's uh, so fluid, it's going to flow down into those surface voids, seal them up. Okay. Uh, the other thing is a diluted emulsion. Think about this. You better use it because the expected shelf life of that is only a couple days. So it can't set in your truck or set in the garage because it's not going to work. You want to bring it out, use it the same day. The other thing that's important with a with an asphalt emulsion fog seal, and I tell this to every agency, don't run and gun. Go out and put down a 500 test uh 500 foot test strip and make sure you're not le leaving too much of this diluted fog seal on the surface or you'll have a skating rink. And there's an uh, old uh, engineer tale. You always, less is best. If you're not sure of the application rate, the application rate should be on a test strip. That way you can adjust your application rate. But if you're never sure, less is best. You're better off to shoot a little less of a uh, diluted fog seal than too much because too much gives you that skating rink. So, you know, you want to be very careful on your application rates. Okay, um, sequence of work, we talk about this, you know, you want to sweep any loose aggregate off from the unsealed surface. Um, always sweep. Every one of these products you should sweep the surface. Uh, road may look clean until you get a broom out there and you'll be surprised the amount of dust that will come up off the, the surface. So everything is going to work a lot better if it goes onto a clean uh, pavement surface. Uh, never put the pavement markings down for at least three days uh, because you're going to get bleeding. Uh, you may not even get some of the temporary markings to stick very well. So it's important uh, to really know what your pavement markings are going to be before you put down a fog seal. So I got a polling question here for the group. And if we could put up this polling question. What is the absolute minimum residual asphalt content of an emulsified asphalt fog seal? 67, 50, 28, or 16? Give me a few more seconds to answer. We have a few more that should be coming in. Okay, we'll close the poll. The answer is really 28%. You never go any less than 28%. Otherwise, you're just flushing the surface with diluted water. But um, you really want 28%, uh, the maximum dilution. And anything uh, above 50, you're actually going to get a slippery mess. So, but the absolute minimum is 28%. Okay, let's move on here. Let's talk about crack sealing and crack filling. Uh, as I spoke to many of you a month ago when we were talking about deterioration of a roadway, uh, one of the reasons we want to stop that oxidation is it's going to really slow the cracking down. And think about a pavement, an asphalt pavement like a rubber band. Um, if you stretch the rubber band when it's new, it's going to work pretty good. But if you lay that rubber band out in the sun for just a short time and, and pull it, you'll start to see all these 
uh, little cracks develop on the surface of the rubber band. Well, it's the same way with an asphalt pavement. They're called flexible pavements. They'll actually expand and contract and they move. But once you lose the ductility, and you, this is based on this oxidation that we were talking about and where we could solve it with the rejuvenators, once we lose that, then we start getting the cracks developing in the pavement. That's why it's important to get on the pavements very early because as they age, they're going to begin to crack. So crack sealing, uh, once you get the cracks, is probably your most uh, cost-effective treatment to keep the water out of the underlying pavement structure. And it really main helps maintain that ba base strength. You're not going to get the pumping. And you know when you get water and the tires are constantly hitting those cracks, you're going to start getting that pumping action and you're going to start to get cupping or in the wintertime tenting of the crack. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But the other thing, you're going to really reduce the incompressibles because if you get a lot of debris in those cracks when you get hot weather, uh, you're going to start getting that pavement to expand and you're actually going to get what we call tenting. You're going to start to see that area rise up. So um, cupping, on the other hand, is when you get pumping action and you're losing the fines and along the edges of the crack, it will begin to dip down or form like almost a small little cup with a crack running right down through the center of this cup. Uh, that's a little late. What's happened is you've lost some of your, your fines and your pavement structure, and now you've got a ride issue. So you wanna get onto your surface early enough so you don't get that cupping or, or tenting. Crack sealing is more of a semi-permanent fix than what crack filling is. Crack filling is just a lot of junk that goes onto the pavement. Uh, and I'll say that in, because they're not using an engineered sealant. Uh, I've seen everything from sawdust. Uh, I've seen all kinds of things thrown in the cracks, uh, sand, uh, pea gravel, all of this stuff that really, uh, they don't really keep the water out. And that's the whole purpose of crack sealing, crack filling is to keep the water out of the pavement structure. Uh, if you seal a working crack, now working cracks are these transverse cracks as this rubber band expands and contracts, just like your pavement, uh, you're gonna get these cracks and they go transverse. Um, those are your working cracks. And if you seal those up, you can get uh, anywhere from five to 10 years and uh, with a good sealant and proper preparation. Um, some people would prefer an overband technique, and we'll talk about that. That will give you another life expectancy of maybe two to five years. Uh, and the sealants are all tailored for your climate conditions. So uh, the sealant you'd use in Missouri is far different than the sealant that would be used in Florida. And so we'll kind of jump into this a little bit. Here is the crack sealing on the left, and they're using an overband technique there. Uh, they blow out the cracks and then they put the sealant on the surface. And uh, so it actually, yeah, that's an engineered sealant and actually seal that crack up really good. On the right, on the other hand, is crack filling. And it looks like they're throwing some sort of emulsion into the crack with probably sand or, or gravel on top of it. And it's not really going to work for any length of time. And, all things considered, when you talk about the cost effectiveness, uh, it's not cost effective because if you can get anywhere from five to 10 years out of sealing a crack, why would you want to do crack filling? It's only going to last you maybe a year or two at the most. So it's all about cost effectiveness. Um, we kind of cover this in the payment distress portion we did a month ago, but cracks related to the environmental and structural distresses. These are the transverse cracks, longitudinal block cracks, and reflective cracks of low severity. Cracks related to structural distress. And you can read them where we're talking about fatigue cracks or the alligator cracks, the edge cracks, reflective cracks, slippage cracks. These are almost temporary fixes because if you have a structural distress I have first to tell you, we're not going to solve that structural distress with any of the preservation treatments we do. 
uh, the problem is much deeper and it has probably taken a lot longer to develop that structural distress. So all we can do is uh, the old saying, you put a Band-Aid or lipstick on a pig is still a pig. Uh, you put the Band-Aid on, uh, on the pavement, it, it's still got a problem. So um, let's talk about a polling question here. Got another polling question. Okay, uh, crack sealing should be used on working cracks. Which of the following is usually a working crack? So we got alligator cracks, block cracks, longitudinal cracks, transverse cracks, and edge cracks. Okay. Let's keep them coming in. Crack ceiling should be used on working cracks. So what's a working crack? Just a few more seconds. Okay, I think most of you hit it right on the head here. It's transverse crack. Um, those are the ones that they go right across the pavement. And that's, I like to compare that to my rubber band. Uh, that's the working crack. As that pavement expands and contracts, those are the cracks that move. Uh, the other cracks really do not move uh, that much. So transverse cracks are your working cracks. Let's get into the equipment because the equipment is really important. And I'm going to show some equipment here, these uh, sealant melters and, and applicators. Um, if you take a look at that sealant melter on the left, if you look into the hopper, you can see the um, melter itself is a double wall. That means it's got a, a oil jacket between the walls of that melter. And it's also got a paddle in there that keeps the uh, sealant um, uh, moving. In other words, we don't want the sealant to set down and uh, break this particular um, product or this uh, particular melter here has a heated uh, core and you can see that um, that stem for the paddle is actually heated. And so it gives you an idea. I had to take one of these at the factory because once they're out, uh, they're so dirty, you can't see anything. They've got so much asphalt uh, sealing on them. Um, trailer mounted air compressor. We're seeing less of these. We're seeing more of a crack back type of being used because of the environmental restrictions now. But it's the same type of thing. We have a, a air compressor here. They're usually a centrifugal compressor or it could be a vein type compressor. But uh, they both work pretty much the same and they have some issues associated with them because the old ones have rings and they have a tendency, the old type of compressors, they can blow oil. And so people will say, well, you know, uh, this sealant didn't stick into my crack and it, <laughs> it's probably no good. Uh, if you put a mist of oil into that airstream on your compressor, nothing's going to stick in that crack. Uh, let's talk about your weather in, in Missouri. Uh, you get some tremendously humid weather, uh, particularly near the rivers, but I mean, Missouri can be very humid. If you go into a, a auto dealership and use their compressed air, you'll probably get water out the end of the hose. Well, you do the same thing with your air compressor that you're going to blow the cracks out. Uh, you're going to have that water accumulate and get compressed and you've got to find some way to remove it. So they have a centrifugal water separator or sometimes they use a two-stage air dryer. One of the things to check is always make sure that the equipment has got an oil removing filter on the airstream or some sort of way to get the water out of the airstream because no matter what engineered sealant you use, if you're blowing a mist of water 
or a mist of oil or both into that crack, no matter how good your sealant is, it's not going to stick. So just some things to keep in mind. Uh, this is that crack vac, crack vacuum. Uses the same concept because one of those lines is your compressed air and the other line is actually a vacuum and it pulls the material back. So rather than putting it into the neighborhood airstream or uh, you know getting it out into the atmosphere, you're actually containing it and putting it back into the hopper and in the back of this truck. So uh, crack vacuums have become very popular and, and uh, so I would look at using those more and more, particularly you're, you're gonna be uh, compliant with EPA regulations and OSHA. I always like to show this because nickel and dime things we could do will, you know, and, and commonly missed opportunities. Uh, if we put a bead of sealant down along this gutter pan, uh, we wouldn't have had this settling. And this is in a driveway. Uh, you can see that uh, the actual pavement is probably an inch below the actual gutter pan. And it wasn't like that to begin with. It wasn't paved that way. What happened was that uh, no matter how well you tack that, that uh, curb, that concrete curb, and as it ages, it's going to, the asphalt is actually going to pull away from the curb and you're left with a joint there. And if that joint is not sealed, then water is going to get in that joint after every rain, rather than going into the gutter pan like it's supposed to, it's going to infiltrate down into that crack. And the crack eventually, when a vehicle hits it, it's going to begin that pumping action and you're really losing your material underneath the roadway structure. So it's going to begin to settle. Think about it like this. What are the two biggest, the, the heaviest um, vehicles that you get in your residential areas? And they're garbage trucks and they're school buses. And it, both of them drive pretty close to the curb. So just think about this. If we had put uh, a sealant when the pavement was new, we could have prevented all of this. Another area we miss an opportunity is around a manhole or a catch basin or a water shutoff valve because as that asphalt ages, it's going to shrink. It's going to open up a joint there. Uh, you can see that you've got uh, vegetation. Well, what's vegetation need? It needs water to grow. So right there, you know that water is getting down into that joint. And left alone, you can see what happens to the uh, manhole cover or the actual casting there itself is just going to deteriorate. Now, uh, last I checked, it's a very expensive proposition to replace a manhole structure. And left alone, it's going to really begin to deteriorate that structure and you'll have to replace it. So. Uh, Nickel and dime things. We could really save a lot of money just by going out and using a crack treatment by doing this. When the pavement is new, just go around, put an overband on there, and you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches in the future. You may have to touch it up after five or 10 years, but you're not going to have that thing falling apart. Let's talk about chip seals. And I think we're doing OK for time, but I'm going to have to hurry it up a little bit. Uh, Let's talk about what a chip seal is intended to do. Uh, everything they talk about, what's the one thing you want to do with a chip seal? To seal the water out of the pavement structure. That's the whole purpose of it. And as I think of a chip seal like a tent, the important part is really your oil. The more oil you can get on the road, the better. And the stone is put on in this chip seal is merely a bridge for your tires to go over that oil. That's the simplest way you can describe it. Now, the stone itself is going to increase your skid resistance if you use the right stone. And if your cracks aren't real wide in the road, less than a quarter of an inch, you can probably seal those cracks up and waterproof the roadway. Um, it's going to extend the pavement life. And it's not how long the chip seal lasts, it's how long does it extend the life of the pavement that's put on. That's really the, the important part of life extensions. It's going to go five to 10 years. If it's a low volume road, it could even go longer than 10 years. 
So it's going to correct. And if you have minor raveling or, or flushing or oxidized pavement, it's going to correct it. Chip seals, uh, this may shock some people. It's the most used treatment in the entire world. If you go over to Europe, you go to the, the Scandinavian countries, everything is chip seals. They use more chip seals and hot mix asphalt ever thought of. So just think about it that way. It's used all over the world. And I can guarantee you, if you think about it like this, what is a chip seal constructed of? It's oil and rock. What is asphalt hot mix, you know, constructed of oil and rock. You can get polymers in both of them. And I'll tell you the reason you put polymers in a chip seal, but people have misconceptions. You can't put a chip seal down on a pavement that's falling apart. It's not gonna strengthen your, your or give you additional load capacity. It's not gonna smooth out a rough ride. If it's a rough pavement to begin with, it's gonna be a rough pavement afterwards. Um, not going to bridge those big cracks. It's not going to fill ruts. And why isn't it? Because a chip seal is what we call a mono layer. It should only be one stone thick. And then it really will not eliminate the need for future maintenance. I mean, you may have to do more maintenance, but I'll tell you, it's going to waterproof that pavement. You can see unacceptable candidates. And you can see more unacceptable candidates. It's not going to fix the ruts. It's not going to fix the poor rides. But minor cracks or early signs of raveling or a light amount of flushing or pavement oxidation or a loss of friction, chip seal is an ideal candidate, ideal uh, treatment for those. So think about that. Uh, people always say seal coat. Well, a seal coat is a whole bunch of things. And when you talk about chip seals, you want to be specific what you're talking about with chip seals. Because we have single chip seals, we have double chip seals, we have cape seals, we have raked in chip seals. And then we have more and I'll show you in the next one. But if you think about it, we want to use a uniform graded aggregate. And what's that mean? We want to get as close to a single size aggregate as we can. And why is that? Because you want the oil in those voids between the aggregates. And so that's the one thing when people will say, well, you know, single size aggregate, that's going to cost me a lot of money. But I want you to think about this. If you have a truck and you fill that truck up with beach balls, you've got a lot of voids between the beach balls and then put softballs between the, vo in between the voids and the beach balls and you're adding weight. And then if you put golf balls in the voids, you're still adding more weight. And if you put BBs in the voids, you're adding more weight. What I'm telling you is that your single size is going to cost more, but you're going to get more coverage with a single size than you would with a dense graded gradation because the dense graded, you're paying for it by the ton and it's not going to go as far. Plus, when you get fines in your chip seals, those voids that we wanted to put binder into, now you're displacing those oil, the, you're displacing the oil that's in the the voids there with these smaller particles. So you're going to get flushing and you're going to get bleeding on your roadway. So it's, it's an engineering predicament and believe it or not, and I'm sure most of you have not seen this, there are chip seal design processes. It's uh, not that complicated, but you want to know your specific gravity. You want to know your flakiness index. You know, you want to know a lot of properties in order to create a chip seal design. And then that, once you get your design, it's going to give you your application rate and you still want to do a test section. So be very specific when you talk about chip seals, single, double, cape, raked in. And here's some more inverted seals, fiber reinforced seal, sandwich seal, geotextile reinforced seal. So I got a 
polling question for you. If we could put that polling question up. So what's the main purpose for chip sealing? Cost, improve friction, waterproof the surface or prevent oxidation? Okay, more people to answer. All right, give me a few more seconds. Okay, the whole purpose, and I think most of you got this right, the whole purpose of a chip seal is really to waterproof the surface because if you can keep the water out and you can reduce the oxidation, you can keep that road alive for a long, long time. And chip seals do an excellent job. And so I just wanna reinforce the fact that you know, it's the whole purpose of all of these is to keep that water out of your underlying pavement structure. And chip seals do a, uh, a lot of good. Now, one thing I'm going to back up here just to explain something. We want voids in this aggregate. The larger the aggregate, the more oil we can put on the road. The smaller the aggregate, the less oil. All right, it goes. It goes without reason that that. But the whole purpose being to waterproof the road, we want to get as large of aggregate as we can on the road. Now there's a compromise. Larger aggregate, you got a greater potential for stone, uh, for um, uh, windshield damage and flying stones if you don't do it right. Uh, but also you're going to have a noisier ride. So you wouldn't want to use a large aggregate into a uh, urban area, but on the other hand, you get in a rural area, you can use a larger aggregate. Uh, we could talk all day on chip seals, so I'm going to have to move on. But this is the whole idea, uniform graded aggregate, single size, and close to a single size as you can possibly get. You can see here the dense graded, how you get the a smaller stone in there and that it displaces the oil. Single size, it locks it down real good. Okay, uh, you gotta have it clean because let me tell you, emulsion will bond to the dust before it bonds to the aggregate. So a lot of agencies are putting a penalty down that the anything with more than 1% um, dust which we're measuring on the P200 uh, is a penalty, but you'll, you're gonna be in good shape if you have 1% or less dust passing the P200 or in the P200 range. So um, that's, that's a quick run through there. A nozzle is very important, 15 to 30 degree setting. Um, you're gonna get streaking, or cornrows or whatever you want to call it if you don't have your nozzle set right. Also, your spray bar height has to be set right. If you have different um, adjustments, you're going to have a real problem. You can see on the left, you're getting triple coverage. And on the right, uh, you're not getting any kind of uniform coverage and that's a cornrow. And I can tell after about six months driving down a chip seal, if the contractor or whoever the agency was did it properly because you'll see these cornrows appear. Rolling, um, the new Ashto spec come out and lo and behold, we need a minimum of three rollers on a job. And these rollers say they, have to make a minimum of three passes and a pass is up and back and up. And um, rolling is extremely important and because what it does not compact, but it orients or aligns the stones. So they're not picked up with traffic. So rolling is extremely important. If you don't roll your chip seal, you're gonna destroy your chip seal because as soon as you turn that traffic on it, those stones that have set in that emulsion, once the emulsion is broke, it's acting, those loose stones act just like a wedge and they start to just tear your chip seal apart. They'll start to split the stones that are already set in the emulsion. And then instead of having one loose stone, now you got three. So rolling is so important. And 
get three rollers out there and roll your job properly. And you'll see the proper way to do it in the Ashtal specs, the new Ashtal specs. Uh, six to eight ton rollers, uh, minimum contact pressure, 80 pounds per square inch. Um, make sure that you're using roller tires, not automobile tires or truck tires. Um, so it's very important to understand the rolling operation. Sweeping, uh, we recommend sweeping. Um, um, if you're using red emulsion and you've got it set and you want a, a rapid set of emulsion for a chip seal, uh, you should be able to sweep within three hours of the placement. Now there's exceptions to that because sometimes you get a high humid day and that, that emulsion just doesn't break and set up quick enough. It might be a little longer than that, but ideally we should be able to sweep after three hours. Okay, um, <clears throat> your first sweep, you're getting those stones off. Um, you never want to lose any more than 10% of your stone. If you're getting more than 10% wastage, then your whole um, settings are wrong and you're paying for something uh, that aren't going to help you a bit because these stones are not very good at shoulder gravel. So I think most people in maintenance realize the difference between loose stone and, and true shoulder gravel. So um, sweeping is very important and you'll make your customers happy. Also, if you wanna put down an asphalt emulsion fog seal after the anywhere from one to three days, it's gonna lock those stones into place, give it a black appearance and people will be extremely happy. And I can tell you the public cannot tell the difference between a chip seal and a hot mix overlay. Okay, this is the fogging one to two days after construction. You can stretch it out to three days depending on the weather. This is what a chip seal should look like. Uh, we have a lot of them around the country that look like this. So uh, don't run away from a chip seal because learning how to do a chip seal is the best thing you can do and it's gonna stretch your dollars for resurfacing very quickly. Okay, a uh, unit price, one of the things that we recommend is pay for the um, emulsion by the gallon and pay for the aggregate by the ton. Because the contractor, they're smart, they're gonna recognize the fact that, you know, we don't have to put as much uh, aggregate down and we can juice up the amount of emulsion. And that's really what you want. And then you pay for the diluted emulsion by the gallon. So these are all important factors. Let's jump into the slurry. And I think we're gonna do all right on time. Uh, slurry and micro, slurry systems. Um, very, very important to use uh, these systems. Um, they do a lot of things for you. They not only waterproof the road, they give you excellent skid resistance. So fill the cracks, uh, they'll stop any raveling. Uh, they look beautiful when they're done properly. And if, you have a rutted pavement um, or you have uh, undulating pavement to a point they will fix that. Ruts they'll take care of depending on the quality of ride. Um, they'll improve your ride if you want your ride on a rougher road to really smooth out, go out and micro mill it and then put a micro surfacing down and you'll think you have a brand new road. Micro mill is uh, uh, something that's very important for agencies to know about. They give you a very smooth surface after the micro mill goes by. Um, this is a micro surfacing on a continuous machine on an interstate highway. Um, when everything is working right, you can see it come out of the back of the box. It's uh, kind of a brown uh, signifying that's the color of the emulsion. But as it begins to break, you can see how it looks black in, in the distance there. Um, a good micro surfacing, you should be able to get traffic on it within an hour. And they're excellent on a high, higher traffic volume roadway. Um, excellent product. Uh, there's two types of placement equipment. You have a truck mounted machine where everything is contained on that machine. Your aggregate, your, your emulsion, your fines feeder, um, Everything is on that machine. And then you also have your continuous machine. And this machine hooks up to what they call nurse trucks or feeder trucks. 
and it never stops. It just keeps going down the roadway. So, and these are your feeder trucks. You have the water tank on one side, the emulsion on the other side. You have the aggregate in the hopper and uh, these things just line up and they just feed your, your continuous microsurfacing machine and it just keeps going and never stops. They, they transfer all the materials on the fly. Uh, your spreader box, very important. Uh, this is what's going to give you your right texture. You have a, a primary and a secondary strike off. And uh, again, uh, we could talk about microsurfacing uh, all day. It's, um, it's a lot of nuances to it. A good contractor will give you a good job, I'll tell you that. And so you want to really look at a slurry or a micro um, as a real good uh, treatment. This is a specialty box. This is for rut filling. You can see the counter rotating uh, augers there. And the idea here is to distribute the larger aggregate in the deepest part of the rut and feather it out uh, along the edges. Um, this goes down one rut at a time. Uh, you'll do the one wheel track and then move over to the other wheel track. And generally speaking, these are in the neighborhood of about five and a half to six foot in width. They have uh, basically those are the two most popular rut widths or the rut box widths, uh, five and a half and six feet. And these are adjustable depending on the depth of the rut. I've got a polling question here. Uh, can we shoot at this polling question? Um, where should a continuous application machine be specified? Residential neighborhoods, parking lots, high traffic roads, or projects of major length? Okay, we'll give you a few more seconds. Just another few more seconds. Okay, we'll close it here. Really, um, you would wanna use your continuous machines in larger projects. Now, it doesn't exclude it from a neighborhood. If you have a huge neighborhood project, um, it may be worth it. But generally speaking, those are neighborhood projects are very good for truck mounted machines. Parking lots are good for truck mounted machines. Um, high traffic volume roads, it could be both depending on the lengths. But, you know, when you're going to do a continuous machine operation and all these feeder trucks, you want to have a project that's got some real length to it. Shorter projects can use these truck mounted machines. Okay. Here's something that agencies really need to pay attention to, and that is to make sure you get a mixed design. Because these are chemical systems uh, that are very sensitive. And these materials are all sent to a laboratory. And these laboratories will develop a mixed design and they'll look at proportions. They'll look at the proportions of emulsion, the amount of water, the cement, what the residual content is of the emulsion. And it's very important to have these uh, mixed designs. And once you get the mixed design, it's almost like a cookbook. And once you look at the recipe, then you've got to bake the cake, which means in this case, you've got the cookbook or the mixed design, and now you have to watch to make sure the machine is calibrated according to this particular design. One of the things you would want is to make sure you know the name of the testing company. You wanna know where the aggregates come from in the quarry. You wanna know where the emulsion come from and the terminal. If any of those change, then your mixed design is no longer valid. So you always wanna use the same materials throughout your job. If you change materials, you've got to change your mix and then recalibrate your machine. With that mix design, they're gonna show you a whole bunch of tests that have been done and you should, 
you will get these mixed designs from the contractor and he'll give you these and then he'll will allow you to observe his calibration of his equipment but these are all things that you would want to see in your mixed design when they hand you the paperwork at your pre-construction meeting or before they start the work and before they calibrate the machines. Um, Ashto has published construction guides for microsurfacing. It talks about your, your paver calibration and uh, it's, it's very important that the machine is calibrated properly. Uh, they talk about a test strip. And remember I said that we want to make sure that a microsurfacing can be driven on within about an hour. Uh, you want a test strip and you want that test strip put down the same, pretty much same conditions as what your job is going to be. So if you're going to do night work, you want to have your test strip put at night. And Generally speaking, your test strip is a minimum of 500 feet. Some states say they want it 500, they want to skip, and then they want to do another 500. Um, that's up to the agency and agreeing with a contractor on that. But the bottom line is you want a test strip rather than going out and just start placing the micro surfacing. All these treatments are very important to get a test strip first if you're not sure. Okay. Got just enough time to go through this. I went through this in the very first session two months ago, but people have always said, how much money should I put into preservation? And they've come up to me and asked me that. And my response is, I haven't got a clue because the only way that you're going to know how much money to put into preservation is you have to know your own network, your own highway network. If you're in a city, you have to know how many lane miles streets you have if you're in a county you have to know how many lane miles you have same way with a state so let me walk you through this because this is how you determine for yourself how much pavement preservation you need to do it's a simple process and i want to explain this every one of you have probably experienced the checkbook in your life you have to put money in before you can spend it. It's the same principle here. You've got to put money into your system and to make sure you're, in, you're meeting your needs. And that's gonna be how you determine. And I'm gonna give you this example. Let's say we've got a county, it's a big county, and we have 4,356 lane miles. And why do we use lane miles? Because that's how you're actually going to pay for your jobs by lane miles or, or by square yards. So you better know your lane miles. Um, if you go center line miles, you don't know if you have a two lane road, three lanes, six lane road, you don't know. So you got to look at lane miles. That's your important uh, parameter. Now, let's just say you have a good pavement management system and I'm doing this as a concept. And your payment management system is into remaining service life and you've got all of these spikes. You have some roads that have no life left. You have some that have five years of estimated life, 10 years, maybe this one right here, 14 years, so on. And this is your total percent of your network. So if you had all of these bars up, it'll come up to 100%, okay? If we don't do anything to our network, and this is the whole principle of pavement preservation right here in a nutshell, what happens to all of these roads each year on average, they move to the left one year at a time and eventually they come into the place that you are have no other options left than to rehab or reconstruct the road. I'll do this again. Everything here in this stack all of a sudden gets piled over to this stack. Everything that's one year goes to zero, okay? All right, think about it like this. And this is something that's so simple it's hard to grasp. Each year, your entire network loses one year. So each one of those lane miles age one year each year. 
So if you have 4,356 lane miles, that entire network is going to age one year in one year's time. So you new unit is 4,356 lane mile years. So simple, it's uh, difficult to grasp. All right, now, this is where the only one that can figure this out is yourself. Because if you're over here, you're working for a city or a county or even a state for that matter, this is how you really can determine how much preservation you have to do. Because take your reconstruction program, for example, you have two projects, 22 lane miles, your design life on this is 25 years. Guess what happens? You multiply your lane miles by your design life. You get the units called lane mile years. We've added up my lane mile years is 1,090, and you can see it's big cost when you're talking reconstruction. Now let's move into rehabilitation. Same pro process, identical. You have three projects. You have 22 lane miles, 18 year life, design life. You get lane mile years when you multiply them together. That comes up to 1,200 lane mile years. You add them up and the cost is still pretty high. Now let's get into our pavement preservation. We're doing a bunch of treatments and they're only life extensions of two years, maybe three years, five, seven. The principle is exactly the same. We're talking instead of design life, we're talking life extensions. Multiply your lane miles by your life extension, you get lane mile years. And you can see the costs are really a lot less. In this case, we have 412. So you tally them up and you add your reconstruction lane mile years, your rehab lane mile years, your pavement preservation lane mile years, and your total is 2702. Well, guess what? You're losing ground because you're losing 4,356 lane mile years every year, and you're only putting 2702 back into your network your network is going to plow itself apart. It's getting worse and worse every year. So what are your options? Well, you're not going to get any more money, so you got to relook at your budget. And I've got a big budget here, but you know, this it's the same principle. You can see that this is without question the values of all of them. Reconstruction, real expensive. Rehab is still expensive. Preservation is real low cost. Pennies in, in essence, in some cases. I am actually creating a deficit because I needed the 4,356 lane mile years and I've only got 2,702 and I got a deficit of 1,654, which means I'm corkscrewing my network into the ground. So what do I do? Well, I have to come back and I have to make some decisions. Rather than 40 lane miles, I'm only going to do 31 lane miles to reconstruct. Now, this is stuff that you have to figure out. Maybe rather than all of these 82 lane miles, I'm only going to do 77 lane miles. Well, what I've done is I just saved myself $6.1 million. It'd be nice if we all had that kind of money, but that's what in this example. So what we do is we go back to the drawing board. And we actually determine, and we have roads out there that can use preservation. So what we've done is we've looked at our life extension and lane miles, and we've increased our lane mile years by using these lower cost treatments. And guess what? We needed almost 2,000 lane mile years. I've got, by adding these treatments, I've got 2,000 lane mile years. And you know what? It all balances. It's not getting any worse. It's not getting any better, but it's staying the same. Now, look at this. I still have a half a million dollars I can do something with. So I could put it into more preservation. I could maybe add another mile or two of rehab, whatever. But I can actually begin to improve my network condition because anything more than 4356, I'm improving my network. Anything less, I'm corkscrewing it in the ground. I use simultaneous equations just to make it come out equal. But just to give you an example, 
it works anywhere. It can work in your city, your county. As a consultant, this is a powerful tool for you to use to advise your, your cities and your counties. Uh, it works in districts. It works in, for the whole state. It works anywhere. It's been proven time again by up against very expensive payment management systems. Now, it doesn't do the same job as payment manage, management system, but this is an estimate you can do yourself on the back of a napkin almost that you can determine how much money you got to spend for payment preservation. So that's the extent of it. Uh, Chris, I ran over a little bit, I'm sorry, but I'm going to hand it back over to you. I will forgive you this one time, compadre. So no worries. I am just going to show you just a couple more wrap up slides final thoughts, if you will. So we'll pop up here. Thank you so much for hanging with us. It's uh, our pleasure to uh, show you. And, and really, I think about this. Are you investing money in the right road? Are you using the right treatments? These are questions you have to ask before you're ready to get started. Uh, and so what Larry has done is kind of lay the groundwork uh, for this. If you're not using pavement preservation, your your roads are basically aging in dog years. And what I mean to say is that uh, instead of lasting 20 years or beyond, uh, they're looking uh, you know, pretty peaked at 10 or 12 years. And so what we're here to show you is some of the ways that you can uh, kind of flatten that curve. We all know what flattening the curve is, is good for, uh, but really what we know uh, that, that, that deploying these mix of fixes is absolutely critical. And you can double or more the number of miles uh, treated with the same budget uh, that you would with using a worse first strategy. And so agencies across the country and across the uh, uh, this uh, wonderful globe are using uh, these different treatments to stretch their dollars and extend the life of these pavements. And, and just to look at my favorite kind of thing, Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary, if you look at the Definition of preservation, it is the activity or process of keeping something valued, alive, intact, or free from damage or decay. And so preservation really implies that we're protecting and taking care of that asset for future generations use, uh, really shielding it from, uh, from destruction. And so that's what we're here to do. I won't spend a ton of time on this. Maybe we can get into this a little bit more uh, next uh, time around. I'll show this, uh, these slides. These are just some treatment costs. And you can see from what Larry talked about up at the top of the curve, you know, you're spending a, maybe a dollar uh, versus what we're going to talk about towards the bottom of the curve, you know, uh, can be 15, 17, 24, $38 and more. Uh, so that's why it's so critical uh, to spend some money up here at the top. We're not saying you spend every bit of your, uh, you know, budget up here at the top, but, but really mixing this throughout and a layered approach is the, is the right thing to do. So let's do one last poll question, then I'll kick it off and we'll uh, get everybody back to, uh, back to work over there. Do we have one more or we may not? Sorry, 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 sorry. That's okay, all right, perfect. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Christy, you're good, you're good. How likely is it that you would incorporate these type of treatments now that you've learned about them? This is uh, this is for our benefit, we can see how good a, a job we're doing. Um, um, and, and so this is really important. And, and it's good if you don't feel like you can answer on those top, and you're not hurting our feelings, we, we do this all the time, but if you don't feel like that's happened, then then definitely reach out to us. Uh, you can find Larry and I on LinkedIn. I, I put my email in the chat. Larry, you may want to do the same thing. Uh, and we can, we can do that. But it's really important uh, that, that, we, that we do this. So I'm just going to share these results. And, and I'm very happy that this is the response. Uh, very excited about Missouri kind of getting in with the uh, Missouri Pavement Preservation Council. So uh, this is exciting stuff. And we are going to be back with you next uh, month. And uh, really remember, you know, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Uh, big fan of this Albert Einstein uh, quote. And again, uh, we, we talk about this a lot. Failure is not the opposite of success. It is part of success. So fail stands for first attempt and learning. So if you failed before using a pavement preservation treatment, 
first you should look at what caused you think caused that failure but don't get discouraged uh it could be a number of different factors that's the important part so uh if there are any quick questions i'm happy to address those uh, if not we'll kind of uh, uh wrap up today thanks for sticking around for overtime and we'll kick it back to uh, uh christy brett uh jack anybody so Thank you guys for come, uh, taking your time out. Brett, I'll let you end it from here. Don't forget the survey. I'll send it out when I send out the slides. Fantastic. All I can say is, wow, uh, Larry, that you really captured um, in your talk today why uh, we decided to create the Missouri Pavement Preservation Council. And that is really to be an advocate for all of you uh, who are trying to extend the life of your asphalt pavements out there. And uh, you can see there's so many uh, different arrows that you have uh, that you can place in your quiver to use. And uh, we wanna be a resource moving forward. So for all of you that have been on here, and if you felt like, wow, this was really a, a tremendous uh, use of my time and great value, we encourage you to invite others in the profession, whether they be engineers or people that you're working with or DOTs or county officials, public works, whatever, we invite them to uh, participate in the Missouri Pavement Preservation Council. For those of you that are on and would like continuing education credits, uh, we'll make those available. Christy will be able to get those out to you. And just a quick reminder, November 16th is gonna be part four of our webinar series. And that webinar series is titled Thin Overlays in Place recycling and reclamation. So you'll wanna make certain to uh, dial in at 1 p.m. on November 16th. Christy, do you have anything? No, I just add the survey and I will send everybody um, everybody's contact information again in the link and a, um, a new flyer with just the part four series on it. That's right. And one last thing, too, if you want to join, if you just love pavement preservation, you're certainly welcome to join FPPC's uh, normal Pavement Preservation Wednesday. That's uh, next Wednesday. We're covering urban heat island and, and pavement preservation. So uh, don't feel like you can't uh, crash the uh, the Florida folks. We're always happy to, happy to have uh, people from across the country. So. Well, thank all of you. And uh... We appreciate your participation and interest. Thanks. Have a great Thanks, guys. day. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. I'll keep this up, Chris, and just in case somebody wants to stick around. Sure. Thank you. Just for a few minutes, in case somebody has a question. Absolutely. I'll stick around too. If anybody has something, they can pop on and ask. I think we're about down to the bare minimum, so I'll probably yep. just shut everybody off. You guys have a good rest of the week. Thanks, guys. Yep. See you. Thanks, Christy. Take care. Thank you, Christy.